Rose Church, how you feeling? Hey, I'm so honored to be with you guys today. So happy to be at church. I remember when I spoke here in November, thinking to myself, oh my gosh, the next time I preach at Rose Church, it will be in your new building. Didn't think it would be under these circumstances, but I am in your new building. And man, I feel like I'm a part of the family. Pastor Andrew said that I'm a guest speaker today, but I am no guest speaker. I am totally a part of the Rose Rose Church community. So, so honored to be with you guys. I love your pastors so much. I mean, your pastors are literally like really, really good friends of mine. And I've been just like inspired by how your pastors have led through this season. I mean, legit. I follow Rose Church on Instagram. And when I see you guys doing creative things like children's programming or or just, I mean, a, a form for people to like get resources from your church. I screenshot that stuff. I send that stuff over to our church and we steal ideas from you guys all the time. I love Rose Church. Super, super excited to get into the word today. I know you guys have been in this series around chaos and things that we've learned from chaos. And man, I'm going to kind of fall right in line with that series. The message today is calm in the chaos, calm in the chaos. We're going to talk about how the fact that sometimes God doesn't deliver us or rescue us from chaos, but actually he anchors us in chaos so that we can be the element of calm when everything's going crazy around us. If you got a Bible, maybe you need to get your you version Bible app open or or grab an iPad or grab a physical Bible. We're going to be going to the book of Luke today. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to go to verse 22. I'm going to read this for you. I want you to follow along. If you're in your PJs, get up, like get, get the fam ready. Like it's time for the word, okay? Uh, let's do this. Luke chapter 8 verse 22. It says this, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. I just want to pause right there. The Bible says that they were in great danger. Like this is not an imaginary thing that they're making up in their minds. Like, I mean, their lives were really being threatened and they're freaked out. I, I want you to put yourself in their shoes, like in their scenario. Like, think about it. These dudes, some of them are fishermen. They've spent their lives on boats. They're not new to storms. So for someone who's been on a fishing boat their whole life to be freaked out in the middle of the water, it means that something severe is actually going on. And, and we don't want to minimize whatever chaos is going on in your life right now, whatever that is for you. I mean, I think sometimes we're tempted to almost compare like the chaos of one person's life and and we say insensitive things like man what, what I, you got an ingrown toenail like I got cancer you know and, and it's almost like we try to one-up each other but at the end of the day these fishermen are scared and they are in great danger and I want to let you know right now whatever the chaos is you don't need to compare your chaos to another person's chaos for God to bring order and for God to bring peace into your circumstance if it's chaotic for you then it's chaotic. And for these fishermen, they were freaked out. In the sea, in the ocean, they were absolutely disturbed. And so it, it says this in verse 24. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Jesus, I love this. Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Verse 25, where is your faith? I'm going to read that to you again. Where is your faith? We're going to center our message today around that question. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples in fear and amazement. They asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. The title of this message today is calm in the chaos. 
calm in the chaos. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're in this room right now, that God, that you're in the living rooms of the people who are watching right now. God, we thank you that discernment still works digitally, that Lord God, your spirit is not limited by the season that we're in, but God, thank you for the technology that actually allows us to preach your word and to sing worship songs to you. God, for some of us, the presence of the Lord has never been this thick in our home, so actually, God, thank you. It's like, thank you. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. God, blessed be your name. And God, I ask that you would minister through me today at Rose Church, that this community would grow, that it would flourish, that it would bud because of the seed of the word that we are releasing today. God, we don't want anybody to watch this message and, and say to themselves, man, that Pastor Manny dude, he can really preach well. No, God, we want people to watch this message and think to themselves, God is a good God and he can bring peace. And, and he spoke a word to me that they did not hear from Manny Arango, but that they heard from the Holy Spirit. God, we pray that in your name. We need you. We're desperate for you. In your precious name, we pray. Come on. And we all said together, amen, amen, amen. One of the first things that I want to bring to your attention, all right, is that Jesus is knocked out in the middle of their storm. Okay, come on. We got to be real. Has anybody ever been frustrated like Jesus? <laughs> you could have picked any time to nap, bro. <laughs> like, why did you have to pick the time when I'm going through the most difficult season in my life to fall asleep in my boat. Okay, the, the, I was a youth pastor for a long time, and and I still really don't understand teenagers. Like they're uh, like they are aliens to me, and so it's funny because like th like I remember the day. Okay, I remember the day where in order to get a girlfriend, you had to use like your two legs. And you had to actually like walk over to a female, like pop a breath mint in your mouth. You had to steal a corny line from like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You had to say something like, girl, you must be tired. And she like, why? It's like, cause you've been running through my mind all day long. You know what I'm saying? You had to do something. Like you had to come correct. Like you had to have some game. You know what I'm saying? Nowadays, there's this whole thing like sliding into DMs. Like I don't even like sliding into DMs. I thought that was like a ride, like at, at an amusement park. Like my, the, the kids in our youth group, like, they can send out text messages. They don't need their legs to get girlfriends anymore. They just need thumbs. Like, that's all they need is, like, thumbs, and they need a girlfriend. I don't, I don't even respect it. I'm just kind of like, this is ridiculous. I remember the day, okay? I remember the day where not only did you have to, like, walk up to a girl, like, you had to actually, like, physically approach her and, and get a phone number, but I remember when she gave you the digits, it wasn't digits to a cellular device. No, 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 no. It was digits to a landline phone. Do you remember landline phones? And you were hoping, you were hoping, you were wishing that when you called, one of two things were not the case. You, the first thing you were hoping is that maybe her older brother was not illegally downloading music off LimeWire or Napster. Come on, because the internet couldn't function at the same time as the telephone. Come on, everybody's remember, like your mama coming into your room, like, I need my phone back, like, get off the internet, right? Anybody, come on, anybody remember like America Online, the disc that you could, you could get internet? Okay, okay, I'm old, I'm old, I'm old. So, um, um, and the other thing that you were hoping is that woo, a parent a dad didn't answer the phone. Like, like you got the digits, you dial in the digits, you know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, you call, and it's like, hello, this is Mr. Robertson. Who's this? And you're kind of like, um, uh, I ain't even nobody, like, never mind, like, come on, you, you were hoping, you were kind of trying to make sure, like, you know, all right, girl, I'm gonna call you at nine, you know, I'm gonna call you at nine, I need you to answer, and, and if anybody's like me, at some point in your dating life, if you're over the age of 30, right, at some point, I remember I wasn't allowed to have, like, phone calls after a certain night, like, after a certain point in the night, and so I would take the cordless phone that was at, not a cell phone, a cordless phone, okay? I would take the cordless phone and I would dial the weather. The weather was like 411. You could dial it and you could figure out what the weather was, what the temperature was, the time. And and but I was waiting. I would tell my girl, I would tell my girl, call me at exactly 9, 10 p.m. Call me at 10:30. And what you were waiting for, you would just you would hear the operator like it is 7:55 in Boston, Massachusetts, and the current weather is 72 degrees with uh. You know, they're just telling you all this information, and then you would hear the beep, beep, 
beep, beep. And then you would click over like, hey, girl. Like with your Barry White voice, like, hey, girl. And she'd be like, how'd you answer the phone so fast? And you're like, I'm a grown man. I got a room. I got a, I got a cell phone. Like, you lying. Like, you lying. You was, just, you was just calling the weather. And I can remember pouring my heart out to my girlfriend. Like, you would never forget. Like, uh, you, you know what my coach said to me today? Like, you, I just pouring your heart out. And then on the other line, you hear... <sighs> Has anybody ever fallen asleep on your boo? Like, fallen asleep on your significant? Like, you are pouring your heart out, and on the other end, you realize that the person that you were communicating to was sound asleep. Oh, come on. I think that that's how the disciples would have felt. Like, we're in the middle of a storm, Jesus. We're in the middle of a chaotic circumstance, Jesus. If there was ever a moment where we needed you to be alert and present and helpful and do your whole Jesus thing, it would be right now. Has anybody ever been frustrated? I, I can see the disciples like huddling around like, yeah, 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 like the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all remember her, right? She didn't give up her home. She didn't give up her family to follow Jesus. And she got a miracle. She got a breakthrough. And we, we didn't give up our whole lives. And we about to drown in a storm. This is ridiculous. I can see them like I can hear them in my mind complaining kind of griping like I cannot believe it's about to go down like this I cannot believe we about to die in the storm and there are other people who have not done as much for Jesus and got more from Jesus and here Jesus has got the nerve to fall asleep and I want you to be honest with me like I'm actually glad we're not even in the same building because that means you can be really honest like right now because if you have ever compared uh oh what Jesus has done for you versus what Jesus is doing for other people you're not strange you're not weird you're not crazy Oh, come on. There's so many times where I have tried to manipulate God by giving him my spiritual resume. Like, God, come on. I deserve for you to do this for me because I serve in the parking lot. You know, so like, like I serve in the most like ridiculous place at Rose, like in the parking lot. I serve, I serve, I help park cars. There's a special place in heaven for anyone who parks cars at any church. Like, I just believe. Like, I got, I'm, I, I take care of toddlers at the church. And, and you're telling me their kid got a scholarship and not mine? What do you mean they got a raise and not me? Have you ever, like, gotten into a huddle where you are, you, you are like, you can't believe that Jesus would do things for other people, but it seems like he is knocked out and sleeping when it comes to seeing about your needs. Amen. You wouldn't believe what happens next, but Jesus wakes up. Jesus wakes up, and he has one question. He's like, hey, guys, where is your faith? And, and I want to, like, hone in on that question because I think a lot of times in church, we misinterpret what Jesus is saying. I think what we think Jesus means is you don't have any faith. Like, I think th this, we've interpreted this passage as if it is an indictment on the measure of their faith. However, Jesus doesn't say anything about the measure of their faith. However, he does make commentary about the misplacement of their faith. And there's a difference between the measurement of faith and the misplacement of faith. Because if I say, where is your wife? That means you have a wife. If I say, hey, where, where are your kids? That means you have Kids, if I say, where are your keys, <laughs> which is what my wife is asking me all, all the time, like, where are your keys? Like, where, where are they? I, I'm always losing my keys. I lose them multiple times a day. That means I have keys. And let me help you. When Jesus says, where is your faith? That doesn't mean you don't have faith. It actually means that you've put your faith in the wrong thing. And I want to help you because if your faith was in your job, guess what? Your faith actually needs to get back into the source. God is the source of your life. He is the source for financial provision in your life. And your job is only a resource. However, when we elevate a resource above the source of our life, then God sometimes actually has to remove the resource so that we remember where our source comes from. See, if your faith is in your spouse, it actually needs to go back into where it belongs, which is in Christ. See, your faith can't just be in a pastor. It actually has to be 
in Jesus. See, sometimes we find good things to put our faith in, but there's a difference between putting your faith in good things and in God. Like, that's not the same. And for some of us, we've got to put our faith back where it belongs because faith isn't a good thing or a bad thing. Actually, faith is a neutral thing. And what Jesus teaches is what's more important than whether or not you have faith is where your faith lives because you can have a lot of faith in the wrong stuff. There are lots of people around the world who have a lot of faith in things that are failing them, but we put our faith in the Messiah. We put our faith in the King of Kings and in the Lord of Lords for whom his name is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. See, Jesus wakes up out of the boat and he says, where is your faith? And Jesus is actually really good at measuring faith. He does it all throughout the Gospels. Like there's one point where he says to the disciples, you have little faith. And then there's other times where he says to people, you got medium-sized faith. Like your faith healed you. Your faith made you well. I don't know if you remember the story with the centurion. He actually says, you've got great faith. So Jesus is competent at measuring faith. And if he wanted to use this story to measure faith, he would have done that. But he's not trying to measure faith. He's actually trying to challenge them because I would suggest to you today that their faith was actually in the wrong place. Now, where was their faith? In order for us to kind of reevaluate where our faith is, we actually have to answer the question of where the disciples' faith was. But before we can even do that, we've got to redefine three very important words. All right, three words. We're going to redefine them. We're going to breeze past these, but you got to write this down, okay? We're going to redefine three words that I feel like we have gotten very, very wrong. First word that we've got to redefine is fear. What is fear? Yeah, see, uh, here we go. Here's Pastor Manny's redefinition of fear. Fear is simply the acknowledgement that something is stronger than me. Fear is simply the humble acknowledgement that there is something that is more influential, something that is more dominant than me. Right now, wherever you are, whether it's in a living room, whether it's like in your car, wherever you are, in any church, there are two groups of people. There's a group of people who fear God. So instead of just like sitting there, like they're a bump on a log, they're actually worshiping, they're participating, because they're like, I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I will definitely enter into his courts of praise, because I'm just afraid of the Lord. Like, I got the fear of the Lord, and it's the beginning of wisdom. And then you have another group of people who are afraid of other people. And so in the middle of worship, instead of lifting their hands and looking around at other people because they're like, oh, I hope people ain't going to be looking at me. And I hope that maybe you're practicing worship at home so that when we do gather again, if you have been struggling with people looking at you, you have practiced in private so that you actually can worship with the community in public and add your praise to the public praise party. Can I get a virtual? Well, amen. Like I, there's two groups of people and, and, and it's not that fear is bad. It's actually what I'm afraid of that is going to dictate whether or not fear is negative or positive. Fear is simply the acknowledgement that something is greater, stronger, more influential and dominant, more dominant than me. Okay. The second word we have to redefine is anxiety. What is anxiety? It's funny. I typically talk to people and they're like, they're telling me about the things that they're anxious over, things that they're overthinking about. And it's funny because I literally have said, okay, like you were anxious about that. And, and when you were anxious about that, did the thing that you were anxious over, like, did it happen? And so many times people are like, yeah, the thing, like Job. Job says at one point, the thing I feared has actually come upon me. And, and it's funny because the things that we're anxious about have a way of somehow confirming whether or not we should have been anxious about it. And, I, and this is interesting to me because I have to think to myself, well, what is anxiety? Anxiety is the, the ability to creatively imagine a negative outcome and then bring a negative outcome out of the, your tomorrow and into your today. There's so many people that I know, they were anxious over a job or anxious over a job interview. And when they actually got to the job interview, they weren't their best selves because they couldn't even fall asleep the night before. And so they ruined their future possibility based on their dream and their imagination and their creativity. 
Which means this, let me tell you something. If you can imagine negative outcomes and bring them into your present, then you can also imagine positive outcomes and bring them into your present. If you can use your God-given imagination to bring destruction and doom and disaster and negativity into your life, then you can use your God-given imagination to bring blessing. Come on, you can use your God-given imagination for you, not against you. If you're watching this right now and you've been struggling with anxiety, I want you to lay hands on your mind and declare this is the mind of Christ. My mind does not belong to the enemy. My mind doesn't belong to lies. My mind doesn't belong to fear, but God has given me the spirit of God and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in me. And I don't operate in the spirit of fear, but I operate with a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Can I get a virtual amen? Hallelujah. Like, like we got to redefine anxiety because anxiety is actually the proof that you are a creative individual. And if you have been using your creativity and your God-given imagination to bring and attract disaster into your life, then that means you can also use that same creativity to build something different. I, I'll say it this way. Like if you've got, if you've got pasta and, and marinara sauce, you, you can make a couple of different things. I mean, you, you can use the same ingredients. You can make lasagna, you know what I'm saying? You can make, you can make spaghetti. Like it's the same ingredients, but different meals. And all I'm saying is if you've got fear and you've got anxiety, then it boo-boo, it sounds like you've got some ingredients to create some faith. But, but if you use those same ingredients, you can actually use the same ingredients to do something that's actually radically destructive for your life. All right, we got one more word, one more word to redefine. The last word we're gonna redefine is worry, worry. Whew, this one hits home for me, worry, okay, worry. Now, I'm gonna be vulnerable with y'all because y'all are family, okay? So don't judge me, don't be talking trash about me. I, I, I do. It's confirmed. I have ADHD. Okay, I got ADHD. I'm like the dog from Up, like squirrel. Like I just like uh, anything can happen, and I am distracted. I think though it is my superpower. I've been on medication for ADHD. I say it's my superpower. My wife does not agree. Like she'll literally be like, "Babe, can you go downstairs and get me some ice cream?" I go downstairs and I start watching Netflix. Like I, I don't. I, I never come back. Like I just. I. I serious. I have a distraction problem. But do you know? What works better than Ritalin, than Adderall? You know what works better than all the ADHD medication I've ever been on in my entire life? You know what helps me to concentrate and to meditate and to focus on one thing for a prolonged amount of time better than any medication I've ever taken in my entire life? You know what works better than all that stuff? Worry. Oh, you know what happens when I'm worried? I'm not distracted by anything. When I'm worried, the only thing I can think about is the problem. And guess what worry should teach you? Worry should teach you that you have the power to meditate. Worry should teach you that you have the ability to concentrate, which means fear, anxiety, and worry should not be working against you, but they should be working for you. If you have been afraid, if you have been anxious, if you have been worrying, then all that is saying to me is that you can stop being afraid of people and start being afraid of God. All that says to me is you can stop imagining negativity and start imagining positivity. All that says to me is you can stop concentrating on the problem and start concentrating on the solution. Baby, if you can worry, that also means you can worship because all worry is is worship in the opposite direction. If I can worship about the problem, if I can worry about the problem, then I can worship the God who is the I am that I am. He is the thing that I need him to be in whatever circumstance I need him to be that thing for me. So now we have to return to the, the launching question. Where is your faith? Now that we have redefined all of these terms, and I hope that those redefinitions were very, very helpful for you. Now we can answer the question, where was the disciples' faith? Because clearly their faith wasn't where it needed to be. Here's what I'll suggest to you today, that their faith was in the storm. Oh yeah. Instead of their faith being in the word that Jesus spoke, their faith was in the storm that they could see. And what happens when we give our faith to the storm? The storm gets wilder and more chaotic and more ferocious and stronger. You know why? Because faith works. Faith will work no matter where you put it. If you put faith in Mormonism, it'll work. <laughs> it'll just work against you. Doesn't matter where you put faith, 
You put faith in the wrong thing, it will work against you. If you put faith in the right thing, it will work for you. Where was the disciples' faith? Their faith was firmly planted in the storm. I'll prove it to you. How do I know that their faith is in the storm? Here's what happens. Okay, okay. Jesus, this is verse 24. Jesus, he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. Why would Jesus need to rebuke? Rebuke? I can understand if he just, like, calmed it. But he didn't calm it. He rebuked it as if it was acting in disobedience. Like, you only need to rebuke something that's doing the wrong thing. But I'm like, a storm is doing what it should be doing. It's storming. Like, that's what it should do. But should you know how the enemy actually tricks us into worshiping him? Woo, this is about to step on all your toes. This is about to step on all your toes. Because what the enemy has wanted from Genesis is worship. It's the only thing that Lucifer has ever actually desired. He did not want to reflect the glory of God, but receive the glory of God. And it's what he try to get Jesus to do to bow down and worship him do you know how do you know how the enemy gets us to worship him he doesn't show up to our house with a pentagram and a pitchfork no 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 he actually wraps himself up in the winds and waves of life and before you know it you're so impressed like negatively by the doctor's report or by the foreclosure notice that now your storm is in what the lawyer said or in what the doctor said. Your, your faith is now in what a person has prescribed over your life instead of in the word that Jesus has spoken. What word did Jesus speak, you ask? Oh, I'll tell you what word Jesus spoke. Oh, okay, I, I need you to pay attention to this. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us Go over to the other side of the lake. Oh, I'm getting excited. Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they started on one side of the lake, and Jesus is like, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And so then in the middle, there's a storm. And I want to remind you today that when you're in the middle of chaos, the thing that should bring you calm is when you remember, God told me that I wasn't going to die in this chaos. God didn't say that I would get trapped in the middle. God didn't just bring me this far to leave me. But the one who started a good work in me is faithful to complete what he began in my life. And I'm not going to worship or put my faith in a storm right now. When I'm in the middle of a storm, I have to look around and ask one pivotal question. Is this the other side of the lake? Because if this ain't the other side of the lake, then baby ain't no storm going to distract me from getting to where Jesus told me I'm going to be. See, Jesus' words weren't just instructions. They were a prophetic declaration to sustain them in the middle of their trial. What is your your calm in the middle of chaos. Your calm is when you close your eyes and remember what Jesus said. Somebody, one of those disciples, Thomas, well, he was doubting. Judas, well, he was trifling. Peter, maybe Peter. Somebody should have been like, Jesus told us we was going to the other side of the lake. Why are we freaking out in the middle of this storm? Jesus told us where we was going, which is why he wakes up. He rebukes the wind and the waves. And then he asks them, where is your faith? Because it's clearly not in the words that I spoke before we got into this boat. And see, some of us, we think that the storm is like um, a consequence for disobedience. Let me help you, boo-boo. A storm is not the consequence for disobedience. Sometimes the actual obedience that you're practicing attracts the storms of life. You know why you weren't experiencing storms when you were a heathen, when you was twerking at the club? You know why you wasn't experiencing those storms? Because you and the devil were going in the same direction. So you never bumped heads with him. The moment you became a believer, you became a traitor. And now there's opposition because you are actually doing the very thing that God called you to do. Where is your faith? And for some of you, God made you promises a long time ago. For some of you, the other side of the lake is represented by an actual thing, an actual promise. He promised you that those kids that are going crazy right now would be saved. He promised you that certain people in your family would come to know him. He promised you that you wouldn't be homeless forever. He promised you that you would get through COVID-19. He promised you that you would be wealthy, that you would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Like he promised you something and now you're in the middle of chaos and you've lost all your calm. And I want to help you today. It's funny because me and my wife, for the past five years, we've been struggling with infertility. As of today, we are still not pregnant, still believing. 
for little Orangos. I remember a couple, five years ago, like me and my wife, we had been married for like a year. I was like, girl, you cute. She was like, boo-boo, you handsome. I was like, I know, I know. <laughs> like the thing that the world needs, I was like, mm, is cute little black kids. Let's do this. Like, like we need little Orangos running around. Six months went by, no kids. A year went by, no kids. Two years, three years, four years, no kids. It's funny because I remember being at the doctor's office one day and uh, a doctor's telling me, a doctor literally is trying to get me to put my faith in them. And they're telling me, you know, you're not gonna be able to get pregnant. Like, it, it looks impossible. You know, do you wanna adopt? I mean, they're just giving us all these options. And I said to my wife, it's crazy, the Holy Spirit brought back this memory. Because before my wife had married me, I, I, I took her and I was like, baby, do you remember? The, like, when you were living in Orlando, my wife was living in Orlando, Florida, as a missionary, preparing to go to Thailand. And I, I, there's crazy, it's crazy random story. Random people that didn't even really know her well said to her, I had a dream the other night that you were pregnant or that you, you had a baby. I mean, on separate occasions, multiple people would tell my wife, I just feel like you're going to be a good mom one day. And at the time, she was a virgin. She wouldn't date nobody. She was like, I hope God ain't trying to do no, like, Virgin Mary thing. Like, I'm good with that. Like, it seemed random. It seemed weird. It seemed hyper-Pentecostal. It seemed like I'm, like, random people telling me I'm going to be a mom. Like, I don't know what to do with that. And then we start struggling with a storm. And all of a sudden, all of the random things that didn't make sense before we got in the boat, all of a sudden, we started to realize why God spoke. Because God will always give you a word before he goes to sleep. Oh, guess what? You are complaining because Jesus is sleeping in your boat. But I want to let you know that he gave you a word before he went to sleep. He's not a God that he would lie or change his mind. And so in the middle of chaos, I've held my wife's hand. And, and I remind her of the source of our calm. And the source of our calm is the prophetic word that we will get to the other side of the lake. And I know so many preachers that they would wait until they got a baby in their arm to preach about this. But I have declared already I will preach in the valley because I know we're going to get to a mountaintop one day. I don't know what your chaos is right now, but I know that you can experience calm. Why? Because Jesus has already spoken over over your chaos you will get to the other side of the lake come hell or high water or disease or pestilence or pandemic you will get to the other side of the lake if you don't lose faith can I get a virtual amen in this church I want to prophesy to your life if you don't get weary in well-doing you will get to the other side of the lake it's so funny because I travel for a living, like, well, not during COVID-19, unless, like, I don't know, one of my really good friends asked me to come to Portland. But anyway, like, I travel for a living, and the funny thing is, um, typically, strangers, I mean, total strangers, pick me up from the airport on a consistent basis. Like, that's just, like, my life. Like, I will fly into McAllen, Texas, or Shawnee, Kansas, or wherever, and someone that I've never met picks me up from the airport. I prank the drivers sometimes. Like, you know, I got to keep it interesting. But you know what I never do when I get in the car with somebody? And I mean never. I never fall asleep. Doesn't matter how early I got up that morning. Doesn't matter how long I've been traveling. The reason I don't go to sleep is because I don't know their driving record or their driving history. I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're just the pastor's cousin. Like, I don't know. I don't know why they were assigned to pick me up. I buckle my seatbelt. I stay alert. I put on my GPS location so that people know where I am. I mean, I am very cognizant because if a driver is a stranger, I wouldn't fall asleep in their vehicle. However, when I go back to North Carolina, when I go back home, and one of the armor bearers or one of the guys or one of the interns will pick me up that I've known for years. If I've been on a long trip, the first thing I do is I recline the seat and I go back and I'll go to sleep. You know why I sleep with them? Because I trust their driving abilities. For some of you, you've been complaining, you've been upset. You've been mad that Jesus has fallen asleep in your boat. But maybe he fell asleep in your boat not because he's neglected you. Maybe he fell asleep in your boat because he trusts that you heard what he said, that you were going to the other side of the lake. You know why Jesus could wake up and actually bring calm to the chaos? 
the real miracle of the story is not that he could bring calm to the chaos. It's funny, I was studying this passage and the Holy Spirit said, what's the real miracle in the story? And I was like, duh, Holy Ghost. The real miracle of the story is that Jesus can bring calm to the chaos. <laughs> he woke up and calmed the storm. That's what the disciples were amazed by. And the Holy Spirit said, that's not the real miracle in the story. The real miracle in the story is not that he could bring calm to chaos, but that he was calm in chaos. He was sleeping, knocked out in the middle of of a storm. And guess what? Some of us, we're trying to rebuke storms and we haven't actually rebuked our own soul. You can't control storms until you can control you. And you can't calm chaos until you calm the chaos within you. And for a lot of us, the storms of our lives are actually a reflection of our soul. And you're trying to rebuke winds and rebuke the raging waters. And at some point, you've got to rebuke the anxiety that's actually living within you. You've got to be internal. And the reason that he could bring peace to outward circumstances is because he had peace in his inner being. And sometimes I think we're trying to bring peace to our kids or bring peace to our communities or bring peace to our job. But we don't have peace to even give peace. And I want to speak to you today because God doesn't want you to just bring calm to chaos. He wants you to be calm in chaos. He doesn't take away the turbulence. No, he actually allows the turbulence to happen while you're on a flight so that you can be calm in the middle of it. Hey, I want to give you one practical to do thing, okay? If you struggling with anxiety, maybe isolation or quarantine or COVID-19 or anything related to what's happening in the world right now has made your anxiety go from like a four to like an eight. Like, like you just feel super anxious right now and, and the chaos just feels like it's out of control. I want you to text the word calm, C-A-L-M, to 97000. I've got a free resource. You're not gonna charge anything. It's totally free. It's a seven day devotional plan. It's going to help you get free from all of the influence of the chaotic world that we live in. I want God to bring order and peace into your life. Come on, let's pray, church. God, I thank you. I thank you that you are the God who's in the bottom of all of our boats that you've spoken. God, you're faithful. God, you are the prince of peace. And God, Portland needs you. Rose Church needs you. God, I need you. God, can you be the God that we know that you could be? God, we don't just worship you for what you do. God, we worship you for who you are. Thank you for every prophetic word that you've ever whispered to any congregant that's watching today or maybe first-time visitors. God, I ask that this uh, sermon would remind them of some of the things that you've spoken over their life. God, we breathe a prophetic word of calm over their chaos right now in the name of Jesus. God, if their home is chaotic, God, we say it's gonna be calm right now in Jesus' name. God, if their inner life if their mind, if their thoughts have been chaotic, God, I ask that this message would help bring clarity and peace and calm into their soul. God, I thank you for my friends in Portland. I thank you for Rose Church. God, ex ex continue to use them to be a beacon of light and hope for so many other churches in this area and around the nation. God, I thank you for what you're doing. We love you. We worship you. You're so good. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, we all say together, amen, amen, amen. Hey, thank you for viewing today. I hope that this message blessed you. Till next time, Rose Church. Peace.